Welcome back, Rebels. Welcome back. Thank you to every single one of you that attended Access this week. Uh, what a great event. That was really fun. Access number two in the books. It was so fun. And I think it, it built on really nicely from the first one as well. I think we definitely had a lot of returning people. Uh, the questions were really good. It was just like a really good evening. And it was also, it's one of those things where the first one we did was just like, a, let's try this, see if it works. We had loads of people saying like how great the event was. And all of those people who kind of posted that on their stories, we'd message them and be like, thanks so much. Like, I really appreciate the feedback. Is there anything you think we could do better? And I think that's important to do with whatever you're doing is to ask people, especially when you're first getting started, it's kind of like beta testing. You're putting something out, getting feedback and finding ways to improve it. And there was someone who said, oh, it'd be great if you could just get when the, the people come on to ask the questions, if video could come up. And I was like, OK, yeah, that sounds like a great idea how the hell do I do this? And then because the platform we were using to do it didn't really have that functionality, but then managed to find a little workaround and that worked much better this time. And I think it's always nice to see people on those, those situations anyway. But um, it definitely kind of improves on the last one and I can't wait for the next one that we'll probably do in January as well. Yeah, definitely. Shout out to you for actively going and seeking criticism actively going and asking people what could be improved so that's kind of accepting that although we had a really good event there was obvious there's always something that that could be improved and i think most people hide from that and maybe wouldn't ask what can i improve because they're scared of the answer it's actually funny because we did that event on tuesday and when i got home like my housemates were watching like the high low the podcasts have just finished that's kind of had the final episode and they did a Christmas special yeah. that I think you paid for and it was all like a charity event. And that was like basically the same as we did, but with just a ridiculously higher budget in a studio with actual kind of production crew there. We've obviously like really high end cameras and stuff filming it. They obviously had someone to flick between different cameras. So it kind of felt like a TV show. So it was funny, like doing our event and being like so pleased with it and then going home and seeing like, wow, we, there's still actually so far we can go. And I think you could take that as being oh, our event wasn't as special as it was in my head. But I took it as like, oh my God, this is so exciting because we can still push this further. And it's nice to be able to see where something can go because I think unless you see it, you don't ever really think what's possible, especially like with a Zoom event or people working from home and watching things from home because they can't actually go to events now. So it actually makes me think there's even more excitement for the future because yeah, I, I've now seen something that's possible that we haven't quite hit yet. So I'm like, cool, how can we push towards that level? Yeah, we're always talking about comparison and how it can be a thief of joy, but it also can be really useful if you're going to use that to, to spur you on. And it's really funny, you mentioned to me the other day that you'd gone back and looked at some of the podcasts that we'd recorded in our old studio yeah. and how budget it looked. Um, and those are, those are up on YouTube. And and it's so interesting. It's like they did, they did deliver value, so they still get views and people are still listening to those. Like people go back and listen to our old back catalogue all the time. And I think we are improving and we are getting better, but we are, it is a really good example of what we say to people of like, everyone's waiting until they're perfect before yeah. they release something. But if you can release it at the stage where you're good enough, then, then you can then build on top of that and you can just get better and better. So there's almost like a magic step of, of, at some point you're going to get to this stage where okay now this is ready for the world yeah. i can release this out into the world i can improve on it i can um i can dissect it i can put it back together again but but it is ready for eyes it is ready for consumption i think and i think that level of when it's ready for consumption is generally probably three steps before whenever people actually release it for consumption because there's always that little barrier in your head of like oh this isn't good good enough yet because to you because you're so involved in it and you've been watching all these different things to get inspiration your standard is so high but I think it's so worth just pressing out yeah so as you were saying there I was going through like an old hard drive the other day and came across loads of our like really early recordings very mind this was only like a couple of years ago and I remember like when we had like our first little studio set up I remember like getting a light in there and I've been like oh my god this looks amazing like we had a couple of proper cameras to record it and I was like oh my god this is like it's so professional it's so amazing and then watching back on the now and being like oh my god that was so not amazing like we've come so far since where we were and like I think 
it's so much is a learning curve like if we hadn't have started then and we'd have waited till we got to a stage when it was perfect then we wouldn't have put any videos out over the past like year we would have still been in this stage of like oh well it's not as good as I was going to say not as good as Joe Rogan but his new studio is awful so <laughs> nothing, nothing to really <laughs> it is, isn't it? yeah <laughs> but um it is that just like starting because you learn so much by actually getting out and doing it and also using comparison in a really positive way of being like well there's somewhere for me to like there's somewhere for me to grow and I think if there wasn't that there wasn't kind of chance to have room to grow then it becomes a bit more of like a trial trial and error kind of situation where you had to try it out does it work no okay we'll try again and it's just a bit harder whereas I think comparison can be so so useful when you can see someone who's already done it and you're like well that looks good they've done that I wonder how they did that and then just try and replicate that so you learn the ways that they did it and then that elevates your skill level and you just move another little higher tier up and it's funny because it's almost like no matter where you are you're going to look back on this in a year's three years ten years time and be like I was so awful back then but I think that's always going to happen and there's always going to be that you're getting better looking back on yourself and thinking I'm better than that person who I used to be and I think that's what's so exciting about life is the fact that you know you're never going to be your best. It's always there's always something more to push towards. Yeah, I, I always say that published is better than perfect, and I don't want to use getting perfect as an excuse because I know we'll never get there. So it means that the content won't actually go out, and it's the the same with my paintings, and same if I write anything, it's it's exactly the same. It's that growing that you mentioned. It's the it's that growth that is for me like that's everything. That's 100%. what it's about for me it's it's like we do this every single week so we can't see week on week that we've grown and we've got better but i can see that in the past year we have got better in the past two years we have got better it's such a a strange thing because when you're in it when you're in your craft when you're in your creative yeah. practice you can't see the improvements but they incrementally just by you doing the same thing each day they are you are improving even if you know it or not and it's very funny when I look at when I look at a painting that I think is the pinnacle of my success and I'm like that's the best thing I've ever painted I will never ever be able to reach that that high standard ever again because it's just too good I will never be that yeah. good again and then in three years time I look back on that painting that's when I go oh wow that's not as good as I thought <laughs> yeah. it was and I can see all of the mistakes and I'm like I'm much better now I'm glad I'm not that person that I was three years ago and that's just the juice. That's just like the exciting part of life is doing these things consistently, getting better and better. And I mean, I hope that I never get to perfect because when you get to perfect, then what? Like you've, you're there. You've there's nothing else to do. There's no growth. There's no improvement. Yeah. And it's the growth and the improvement that I enjoy. I think that's what we talk about so often is just like loving the process, and that's what that is, isn't it? It's like loving the development, loving getting better loving being able to look back and think wow I have improved here and I suppose that's another way where you could use comparison in a really positive way is by comparing yourself to your previous self and thinking like how have I improved what have I done better here and like really taking something from that and being being proud of yourself I think that's what a lot of it comes down to is being able to look back and being proud of where you've come because I think that's a real sense of achievement and that kind of comes down to that when there's like those two sides of happiness the kind of like quick fast happiness and then the, the one that's a real grind and you actually it means a lot more to you and I think if you by looking back over a career or over the, a certain period of time in doing something I feel like then you think about all of the ups and downs and stuff that have happened along the way and like the kind of times when it's not been so great and it's looking back there where you're like ah yeah it kind of adds that joy to the past even when it wasn't but like it's, it's funny because it's like it might have been really bad in the past but then now when you're looking back at it comparing to where you are now you only remember it remember it in a more happy way rather than the actual kind of trauma that it was at the time yeah anyone who's a long time listener will know when we've spoken about our beans and noodle phase and how fondly we look back on those times that we were comp completely miserable and so to anyone that's listening to this right now that is in that really beginning growing stage or like you're you're one or two years into your business and you're like ah, I don't know what I'm doing it's like you will look back on those times with the fondest memories and to think once you've made it when you look back on those it's like 
it's so like the more adversity that you can have the the more confident you'll feel coming out of it because you'll you'll be like okay here's the thing that i've got but also to get there i went through this i went through this i went through this and it's just like that's amazing it's not even just those people at the start now it's like this year has been crazy like for so many people it's been a real struggle mm. and i think if you survive through this and you keep going you'll look back on this time and be grateful that you did get through it and think about it in a more positive way than you might actually be feeling now. And I think that just comes down to that perseverance of just pushing through it because it's, we, like we started our business off the back of the last recession and it was hard and it was horrible, but because we made it through, as soon as times get better again, you really start to like, you, the momentum goes with you. Like as the economy boosts back up, everything gets better for you. And I think it is just a matter of sticking through it whilst it's crappy because it will get bad on the other side. As Torre said on a, on a prior episode, you only fail when you stop. Um, and so, yeah, just, just keep going. No rainbows without rain. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about um, being perfect. Guess what, Adam? Another person that talks a lot about being, well, she talks about being happy, not perfect, is this week's guest. Yeah, so this week we've got Poppy Jamie on the show. It's a really interesting episode because she has such a brilliant philosophy on life which i think like we resonate with if just it's better to be happy than perfect and i think that comes down to what we were talking about at the start of this where when you're starting something you want it to be perfect you want to put out this perfect product but no one does that like look at apple like every time they release a brand new thing the first one's always a bit crap it never it never works quite the way you expect it to and over time it gets refined and refined and refined and that's where it becomes these perfect products that people like can't live without so I think you need to just put your stuff out there because the world will tell you what's right it's like when we did the first access event that we're saying before like it wasn't perfect but we got the feedback and we tweaked it and it was better this time and next time it'll be better and it'll keep getting better and I think that's the important thing that we enjoyed doing it I think that was the best part of it like both times we've come off the end of it rang each other and been like that was so good like we had such a good time doing that and we wouldn't have done a second one if we weren't happy doing the first one. And I think that's another very important thing to do. Like if you don't enjoy it, don't do it. So yeah, Poppy Jamie is an entrepreneur, podcaster, and mental health advocate. When Poppy explained to us that she grew up with a mother as a psychologist and a father as an entrepreneur, everything made sense. Poppy has launched a successful accessories line. She's built her own app and through various projects helps people to become happy, not perfect. In this episode, we talk about failure, flexibility, and fish. And the big fish goes, hey boys, how's the water? And the two fishes look at each other and they go, what's water? Hi, Bobby. Hi. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm really well, and thanks for having me. I've been really excited about this show. A lot of people have a difficult decision as to like whether they should go to university or not. But for you, that decision was made for you, wasn't it? Oh my gosh, that is really good research. Um, yes, it it was. The decision was made for me and um, it was one of the worst moments of my life because I have always been um, a very determined person, I guess. Even from when I was kind of eight years old, I used to kind of set a goal and nothing was going to stop me. And so that kind of obviously fed through to A-levels, um, which is for American lis American listeners, you know, the exams you do in, in England before you go to or think you go to university. And I was a proper kind of, you know, revision timetable was labeled to the minute. It was like, get up seven, start revising 7.15, pink, post it, you know, then change subject 7.25, blue, post it. And um <laughs> <laughs> and I, every, there was no stone unturned. A boffin, basically, is what we used to call it. A boffin, yeah. I was, I was, yeah, I was kind of Hermione Granger, um, if if there was a Hermione Granger in real life. And then, <laughs> um, not, and I just because I always thought I always think that I'm okay with whatever happens. I can handle the result as long as I know I've put everything in I've tried my best that's always been kind of my mentality so then at the, my last A-level exam I could smell the finish line I could feel the celebration I tried my hardest and then 10 minutes before the end of the exam 
I didn't even realize I brought my phone into the exam as a complete mistake and it went off and I never have my phone on me usually and I would never ever have my phone on loud and it rang out this exam hall and within five minutes I'd been disqualified from my A-level which meant that I left university essentially with two two exams not three and obviously failed get, getting into university. And at that moment in time, when this was the only thing that mattered in my life, it was literally like the, the world was over. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Exactly. See, that's the kicker. And at that time, how did you feel? And, and how did you cope with that? Well, actually, I had zero, I think I had zero coping strategies. I cried a lot. I mean, I was hysterical, I remember. Um, and I spent that summer in, in what I remember is just a complete deep haze of depression because all my hope for the future had gone. And I talk about it now and I think to myself, God, how small, you know, because everything's relative, right? Everything mm. we've done since. And, and I'm sure um, certainly people have experienced much, much kind of greater trauma. But I think it was a great lesson that everything is relative. And if you care about something, it can really have an impact on you, regardless of how ridiculous you think that is. Um, and at the time, this was the most important thing in my life. So when it's taken away from you, I, it was, yeah, I was completely, um, I, I felt like, I was going nowhere when everybody, everybody else was going to achieve their dreams, trotting off to university or going on gap years, whatever they decided to do. I was the, the girl that was lost and hopeless. Um, but it was the most amazing thing for like building mental resilience. Uh, and I think adversity does that to you. It's like it, every, I, I, I've, I've yet to meet someone that said, I wish I hadn't gone through that terrible time. Yeah. So what did you do? What was the next steps after you've, you've had a good cry? Then you picked yourself <laughs> up. What's, what's step two? So I got a job. I decided, so I, I, was, I, was, um, I grew up in the countryside, um, uh, just outside Leamington Spa in the Midlands, for anyone who knows. And I said, right, I'm, I'm moving to London. And I had no money. And I just, and I, I had gone to stay with a friend for three days. And we'd gone out. And I met someone at the bar who told me they were doing this really cool job, which was um, at that time, kind of, I guess what we all know now is like influencer gifting, but it was kind of like celebrity gifting in 2008. And I was like, and he was like, oh, I've just been with Girls Aloud. And I'm like, no way, it's the coolest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. And, um, and I said, and I, I just asked a stranger, can I have a job? And he said, um, uh, yeah, well, like, yeah, I guess we could, give you some work experience maybe before a job. And that was it. That was my first job. I was 18 and um, and in that summer, so I'd been disqualified for my A-levels and then I got stabbed in the head in Oxford. It was it was one of those, as in, in my kind of top right forehead um, by a girl trying to steal my handbag. So I was, I'd really had quite a traumatic kind of summer. And then a week later, I started, I did, I went to my interview and I started there and, um, and I never left London until I moved to America four years later. But I, yeah, my, I mean, my first job was when I was 16, but pretty much from the day I left school, I've been working. Have you always been that person kind of confident enough to just go up to someone and say, can I have a job? Because I feel like that's quite a brave thing to do. I think in a way I was, I think I had nothing to lose. It's mm. like, I knew I didn't get a job. I was not going to be able to move to London. I wouldn't have any money. And it wasn't even a thing of, do I have confidence or not? I didn't even have the luxury, I guess, to go, do I have confidence to say yeah. this? It was like survival. It was like, I need to make this work in the next three days. Otherwise, I'm going to be living with my parents in my eyes till I was 40. And so it was kind of almost maybe, yeah, it was out of just sheer need rather than I didn't even have time to get into my head about it because it was like, I need yeah. to get out. And this is a route to. There's so much to be said for kind of that, that mentality of like, just going out to get it because if I said to you like okay well you've got to do this by next week otherwise you'll be homeless you would 
you would act in a completely different way to how you would normally act in that week. And I think there's definitely like a bravery that comes from kind of need and kind of like that desire to like, well, there's without, if I don't do this, things are just over. And I think people kind of sometimes fall back into that kind of comfort of just, oh, well, things will just happen. I'll just keep going along. But to have that mindset of, I'm going to go out and get this like it's the last thing I'll ever do can be really, really powerful. I completely agree. I think that, um, and sometimes I actually use that as a tool to like get me motivated. Um, and I, I, I can't say this is always helpful because sometimes I think it can lead to putting too much pressure on yourself, which is, has its massive faults as I, as I know, and I can, you know, tell you about that. But yeah, sometimes when I'm really kind of low on energy or low on motivation, I kind of try to take myself back to that point where I go, well, if you don't do this, if you don't just make the effort and just push through, then, you know, I psych myself out. I'm like, well, all these terrible things will happen. Um, and look, I'm, I'm not saying that is a good tool to use all the time because I think it does create unnecessary pressure. But if you are in that kind of malaise and like, you're just, we always have those moments, all those weeks, even it's just really difficult to get yourself to do anything or focus. It is quite a good tool just to, you know, give a kickstart. I suppose it's almost like reframing what you need to do into like giving your own personal deadlines on stuff. Because if you say like, oh, I've got this is going to happen in the next year, then you'll kind of like slowly take about take that like you'll slowly do it. But I think by saying, well, what would this look like if I had to do this within six months in two weeks? What would I do to do that? It's kind of not necessarily forcing yourself into a pressure zone of like, well, this has to be done in this time, but just reframing it of thinking, well, instead of this having to be done over the next six months, if I had to do it in two weeks, what routes would I go about to do that? And I think by doing that, you can quite often unlock little routes and kind of ideas that you wouldn't have come across like normally. Absolutely. And then another thing I think I was kind of didn't realize I was doing naturally then. And now I pr probably do this in a bit more of an organized fashion, but say, okay, if I really want to do this and I just kind of work back my steps. So that means I just know I've got to do that first step because I've got that goal in mind. And I think, you know, breaking down kind of larger goals into really small ones, you know, I'm sure tons of your guests have said that, but it is the most effective way because sometimes when we look at these big lofty goals and you know the research actually shows having too big a goal it can actually be counterproductive it's breaking it into the smallest smallest thing like today if I just send that one email um, it means that we are more efficient quicker and more effective in progressing in whatever route we want to I know you've done a lot of research on on the human brain and our weird 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 behaviors and comfort is one of those things that that really mystifies me because so many people will will take the comfort of a familiar situation over the new even if that familiar situation is something that is negative for them that that impacts them badly they'd rather carry on doing the bad thing than make the change because the change is so new oh my gosh i know familiarity Oh, yes, Jesus, it is that cosy uh, and it can be very destructively cosy and the brain loves familiarity. And I think the best example of this is, you know, people date the same people, even though they know they're not good for them. And um, if you're used to be treated in, um, in not the best way, you actually without realizing it, your brain seeks out that the same situations. Um, and that's when I think self-awareness is the greatest gift we can give ourselves because when we become aware of the scenarios we've become familiar with, we can actually rationally, objectively say, is that good for me? Does that really evolve me and nurture and nourish me so I can be an environment that's getting, you know, my, my best self out there? Um, and I think that's the same in, um, you know, work scenarios. You know, if, um, if I mean, just use a, a personal example, you know, my in my first, not the job I was just talking about, but in some of my first television jobs, I had 
you know, bosses that were terrible bullies, like really, really bullied me. And in my kind of early working life, I began to think that was normal and familiar. So then when I found someone who was kind of like really dogmatic, very false from their views, I kind of thought, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's, that, that's what all bosses are like. Oh, they seem great. And actually I was just thinking that was normal because it was familiar. And actually mm. I realized that that was really unhealthy. Little by little does it like undermine your confidence. And then suddenly you wake up in a couple of years time and you're like, where did my self-esteem go? It's funny, we've, we've actually had members of staff come to us and say like, you guys need to be more, like you need to be more disciplinary <laughs> with us, which is so funny. Like what a crazy thing for staff to say, but like we've we've actually had that because because we don't have that experience of like having bosses ourselves and we just kind of accidentally fell into this role of being bosses that the staff who have had bosses are coming to us and going like, you're not doing this completely right because you pretty much let us get away with fucking anything we want to do. So it's like, it's like finding that balance. It is. And it was interesting because actually on my podcast, I just interviewed um, a really interesting um, astrophysicist called, called Dr. Robert Gilman. And he was saying that we are transitioning eras. So he's, he's studied culture for the last 40 years and he believes that we're moving out of um, the empire era into the planetary era. And so when I asked him kind of what the difference is between the eras, empire era really kind of stems from the agricultural um, kind of revolution and the industrial revolution, which is these kind of dominant societies like boss kind of like employee or worker or whatever. And actually we're moving into the planetary era where those kind of relationships are breaking down and it's so much more about collaboration. And so I actually think that the the way that there's so much more freelancer, you know, there's so many more consultants or freelancers, so many people are choosing to work for themselves um, and 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 team up with people on a project rather than work for someone. And I think that's a really interesting kind of pivot and something that wasn't so common even 10 years ago. I mean, it's definitely been the last five years, people have been able to set up their own businesses and make it work for them. So I'm kind of in favor of you guys, you know, being bosses in the way that you just said you are being because actually it then becomes the individual to be giving their own discipline. It's like taking responsibility and accountability for ourselves and not kind of wanting our bosses to almost be our nannies. Yeah, I think society works in a way that is very reactionary. And I think what, you, what we probably find there is the fact that people are reacting to the current situation of there being these bosses in this industrial revolution style way. And we're like, I don't like that. So I'm gonna go away from that and then start being freelance. So I imagine, yeah, what will happen more in the future is people will go away, be separate, and then be like, oh, actually, let's come back together. And I think that's where, as bosses, we act in that way because we've never worked in those other environments. So we're just a bunch of individuals who've come together and formed something the way that we want it to be formed. So yeah, so I hope that that will be the case. And I can see the way it's going now with a lot more people going into freelance and going separate that yeah that'll all come back together and then that'll probably break down in the future and everyone will go separate again but there'll be this kind of like fluctuation like you see a lot of different times yeah but do you think I just don't think we're ever going to go back to where we were before in these kind of like maybe like power struggles and what this for example this kind of astrophysicist was saying that actually the greatest skill we can all have moving into the future is ha being a harmonizer, being someone that like harmonizes relationships. And, and I think that's what we all crave from our working life, right? Is this harmony, is this, you know, kind of a creative expression and you can have creative expression if you're in, you know, you don't have to be in the creative field to have creative expression in your work. But I do think that we are re- completely redefining what it means to work. And it's not this kind of like, oh, handcuff me, I'm going to a job, but I get to express myself. I get to evolve myself. I get to grow and challenge myself. In a hundred years or 50 years time, I believe that we'll then finally realize the actual impact that the internet has had on everything that we do, life, work, and just the dissemination of knowledge. And as we do move into this sort of new era of how work is done, that will permeate into the internet so that so that those experiences that you had with bad bosses, people will have that red flag straight away because they won't 
because yeah. they'll know from the internet like this is not how things are even if it is their first job whereas if you look at even even the office i mean so when the office was first set up that would be what like 2004 or something like that that prob- they probably dropped that show and so really like early days of the internet there's not even many internet references within the show and it was a parody but like there's so much truth in that there's like michael scott is we can see bosses people that we know like just that that weird character that he is that's why the show works so well is because people everyone knew a michael scott relatable yeah yeah and and so but as as we like i think we'll we'll move away completely from from that just because the internet will do this this amazing job of educating us all of like what's okay and what's not Tell me if this is not true, but like it strikes me that you're not afraid to fail, and if that is true, then where does where does that come from? Am I not? Yeah, I don't actually. I don't think I am afraid to fail because I think I failed so many times, um, and I've just continually failed from from honestly as young as I can remember. And my parents, I think this really actually testament to my parents. My mom's a psychotherapist, and my dad is an entrepreneur. Um, and so we grew up in really kind of quite a lot of like financial instability, thinking that my dad's business was going to fail like every year. And then, so we were always kind of, I guess, not afraid, nothing, it wasn't very comfortable. So as a consequence, I think we all just got, we learned that that's okay. And we'll just, we'll, you know, we'll get through it. And it was always this, you know, we learn and it was ingrained in us that we were, there is no such thing as failure, I guess. Like we'll always work through it and um, life is always going to give you twists and turns. And um, and and my mum is really a huge advocate of kind of, of failing. She, um, you know, it was always encouraging us to go for everything and also never really expecting to win. So I think it was, it was, the focus was always on put as much energy as you possibly can into something and the result is meaningless. And that was what we kind of like grew up to, to learn. And, and so, you know, I, I mean, I was always the person that ever got pit for the team, you know, I was like, I was always, always reserve, which is the worst because you, <laughs> you got brought along to the matches, but you just weren't always put on the pitch. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're perpetually reserve and, you know, you're in, on for the last five minutes of the game as, a, as like the pity five minutes uh, just for traveling like three hours to go to, a, you know, do you know what I mean? But it's, it's perspective, isn't it? It's like you go back to the A-level story and it's like as soon as you realize that that wasn't the end of the world, then that's what you, you mentioned the, the word earlier, resilience. It's the more resilience you have, the less the, the failures are even a consideration. Yeah. And also it's, I think it's, um, failure in my eyes is, is, is wrongly placing the focus because it's on like, and look, we always say it's, you know, it's about the journey, not the result. And that feels like very cliche, but you know, when we, when you, when you really break down, what does failure mean? You break it down, but what does it mean for you? Usually it's actually touching upon a sensitive bone that lies way deep in your psyche. Like, what does winning actually mean to me? Does it mean validation? Does it mean acceptance? Does it mean that I can start validating myself? Or why are we not validating ourselves to begin with? What do we, why are we not complete right now? What, why are we, why do we need that thing external to us to make us complete? And so when we start to like really explore what failure means, we suddenly realize that everything is, Every, nothing really matters aside from like how we're feeling right now within ourselves and what we need right now to you know make ourselves feel complete it's really interesting because what you were saying there um especially about building resilience and like obviously a lot of things that happened to you when you were younger built resilience for you and I'm just thinking like for the people who didn't have that kind of resilience growing up because things didn't happen how can you build resilience and I think that just comes down to like you need resilience so you're going to need to fail and I think that's why it's important to fail because without failing you're not going to get the resilience and if you're not putting yourself in the situations where you can fail it means that's not you're not going to build resilience in the long term so I think yeah that comes down to what is so important to not be afraid of failing because you can't build resilience without it. I think that's why like martial arts is so popular because it's it's 
it's one of those things where you put yourself in this completely foreign situation and then you you work your way out of these holes and there's always someone better than you. So you always have this continual like failing tap out, start again. Absolutely. And I think it is, um, you know, face your fear. Like every anxiety that we have can always be overcome when we face and walk into it and that's the thing where it feels again you know if you put your hand on on the fire you learn to obviously you know take your hand off the fire and I think sometimes we've learned to move away from our anxiety or move away from our fear because it feels scorching at times it's uncomfortable and actually it's the opposite it's like training ourselves to walk into it and kind of and using all the tools that I talk about a lot in my app and the book I've just written um and the book funnily enough the book I've just written actually it's all about a strategy really to move through your fears move through your anxieties to build resilience and it's, and what I I actually think a better word for resilience is flexibility because sometimes, you know, even though I do sometimes use the word resilient, it sometimes feels a bit overly tough, like grit. And often Mm. when we are feeling wounded, we are really vulnerable, like we're really wounded and that's okay. And I think to have that sensitivity to like be able to give yourself that like nurture and care and a slightly softer way to move through, you know, these challenges uh, was important for me. So flexibility is this idea that we can always stretch through challenges. We can always, you know, if something kind of knocks us over, it's about kind of bending our way to get back up. And, um, you know, if you look at like the physical body, when our, when, you know, when, we're, when our limbs are bendy, we get broken less, right? We can kind of like fall over, get back up and our body, our bendy body helps us. And I feel that that's the same with kind of our psychology too. How do we have bendier psychology, which means it doesn't matter what comes our way. The wind kind of bend us in lots of different directions, but we know we have the confidence to always kind of like stretch around it. Flexibility also conjures up to me the the sort of willingness, and it, and when I look at your life and career, it's is so it features so prominently of of like being open to opportunities and seeing where things will lead you. And so, for example, the man on a park bench who just mentioned something to you and then completely changed the trajectory of what you were going to do. I am a huge believer in serendipity. And I just read a book actually called Serendipity by Dyker Begg. And it's a book that was written 20 years ago. And um, and it's about us waking up to the small little signs that happen in our life and taking those tiny little windows of opportunity. And that to me was talking to the guy at the bar when I'd just been, you know, in vertical commas 18 and my life was over. But it was like those small windows. And we all, I believe, we all get, we all get given equal amounts of small windows of opportunity and the ones that have trained themselves to be looking out for them. So for example, like a little window of opportunity was I'm on Instagram. I saw one of my friends, like the wonderful and talented Emma Gannon. She'd just done a shoot with you, Adam. And suddenly I was like, oh my God, really love his style. That's really cool photography. Messaged him, obviously didn't know if he was going to reply, didn't know like any, any of it, but obviously he replied, we did the shoot and now we're doing this chat. But it was these small, tiny things, and they present in the smallest of instances. So the reason why I got my first television job in um, in LA uh, working for MTV was because I started talking to the person next to me on a train going down to Devon. And it was like, you know, a random train journey, Sunday morning. I think we were both quite hungover. I was with my housemate at the time. And we just got chatting to the girl next to us on this kind of uh, table seat. And she turned out to be a producer at producer MTV in LA. And I was like, oh my God, no way, I'm a TV presenter here. Um, I would, you know, I'm coming to LA in a month's time to do this job. And she, she gave me her card and she was like, email me. And then from that, I got my first job in America. And that was from meeting a random person on a train. How do you, for someone, because I feel like there's to, almost like to be successful in that, then it become, it all comes down to being able to spot those windows of opportunity. And I imagine there'll be a lot of people who just don't spot them. Like, what is it that you can do to be able to get better at spotting those 
opportunities? Great question. This is in my book, in the last chapter, when it when it's about creating a flexible future. And what's so fascinating is I have named it future bias. And the reason why I've called it future bias is because it is based on the concept of confirmation bias that we, you know, science has proven we all have. And confirmation bias is basically our brain is being fed so much information. So we have kind of almost like we've trained our brain to alert us to the really critical things that are interesting and relevant information to us. Um, a basic example is um, you, uh, you, you know, you've just bought your first car and suddenly you notice and it's red and suddenly you notice loads of red cars on the road. Before you bought that car, you, you didn't, you weren't noticing any cars on the road because it wasn't relevant information to you. You weren't a driver. And suddenly you've just got this car, it's red, and you're noticing, oh my God, everybody has a red car. It's like the coolest thing to have a red car. But it's just because our brain has now created a new file that says red cars are important. So this happens in every aspect of our life. Um, you know, people that have bought the same clothes as you, that becomes relevant or, you know, small things and actually slightly deeper things like, you know, everybody, it depends what your view on the world is. Everybody wants to fuck me over. Well, that means that you will go around trying to find evidence. Your confirmation bias is set to everyone's trying to fuck me over. So let's look around every situation I'm in. Who's trying to fuck me over? Who's trying to undermine me? Um, and, and so we've got to be really careful and really dig deep and really ask ourselves, what are our, our core beliefs? And we all get, you know, instilled core beliefs from when we, when we were little, obviously, you know, whoever was in our environment from school, parents, family, friends, whatever, but obviously later in life, but the most brilliant thing about the brain, and this is the reason why I've dedicated my life to studying it is the fact we can change it. We can change our filters. We can change what our brain tells us to look out for. And so one of these things is called the future bias. So how can you prime your brain to look out for opportunities that are going to help you towards your goals and values in life? And this is when I'm a huge, 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 huge advocate for getting a prick stick out and doing vision boards and stuff like that. Because as much as, you know, the manifesting movement can create an eye roll now and again, Actually, the science behind really writing down, and I'm not sure when this podcast episode is coming out, but for example, a great time to do it is before a new year, right? But you've got that all that new energy. We're going into 2021. It's going to be different. Loads of exciting newness changes happening. Well, what do you want to achieve from this year? And it is as basic as getting some pictures, writing it down, journaling, and really going through, um, you know, kind of like one by one what you want to do. So what you do is you actually tell your brain, all of these goals on my list, they are very relevant to me. So then it goes into your subconscious, which is your kind of watchtower. Um, and then you're walking through life and suddenly your, subcon your subconscious, without your conscious brain even realizing, brings up to the front of your mind, hold on a minute, did you just see that advert? They're looking for X, Y, Z. And suddenly you're like, boom, 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 goal list, relevant information, opportunity. And it just then takes you to take the action, to take that nugget that your subconscious has cleverly brought to the top of your mind to go and reach out and, and do something about it. And when you're putting together these vision boards, how important is it to set like realistic goals compared to things that are just like ridiculous? So for example, if someone was like, I want to live in a castle and just putting all these like, I want to be a millionaire and putting all these just like huge, huge goals in there compared to ones that are achievable within a short period of time? I think both. I think it's having your 10 year goals and then your five year goals and your one year goals. So 10 year goals. And also this is why I call it the flexible future, because for example, it sounds ridiculous, but when I was little, for example, I was like, I really, really want a pony, you know? I never got a pony, but one time um, I, 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 my friend got a pony and got to look after that pony for the whole summer. Well, arguably, I manifested that. I, you know, like it wasn't mine. Like I think our goals can come uh, like different they can come in different packages and that's what that's what I think makes life fun because you can be like okay this was part of the package I asked for and it's still pretty great so if I want to live in a castle and then suddenly you get a job like I don't know doing something with a castle you're like ooh, I'm one step there um so I think it's it's I think that's why I call it like flexible goals because I think it's really important to have those huge goals because 
you know, life works in mysterious ways. Like, and I also think that sometimes we can get quite deflated and feel disappointed when feels things don't feel like they're happening quick enough, you know? You know, I'm working so hard. Why is that not done yet? And actually, like, you know, I think life is like um, snakes and ladders. You know, like sometimes, like some people have got, you know, they've got a ladder and they're like, you know, eight steps ahead and we're like oh god and then you know we've just fallen down the snake and we're back to kind of square one and then suddenly we get the snake that takes us up to 12 and the person is just the other person just sort of snake like we're all playing a game of snake and ladders and we're all kind of going at the same pace but you know all of us experience different bumps in the road at different times because you said the 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 word core belief so this this is who i believe i am at my very core if i'm if i believe that i am a negative person i don't like other people that everyone is out to fuck me over it, it, it's it must be more than just a mood board right what other i'm guessing this is like a slow process that takes that takes years or or a long time to to recover from I think that uh, going back to kind of what I said, self-awareness is the greatest gift we can give ourselves. All of us have got faulty core beliefs. And in my book, I write about the faulty core beliefs that drove me into kind of a, a mental health crisis. So all of us, doesn't matter who we are, will have micro and macro traumas and um, faulty belief systems, like I'm not good enough. I mean, that's a huge one. I'm mm. not worthy of that. Um, you know, deep down, even if we don't want to admit it, you know, we're not going for things because we think that, you know, we're not like good enough for it. As I, I repeated it again, because it's just such a huge one. So, I mean, I, I've met very few people that think they're good enough. You know, it's, um, yeah. I, you know, I think our world has, told each and every one of us that we're not good enough for so many mm. years that it is pretty difficult to completely decondition. And that's what we're really talking about here. We're talking about a reprogramming, a deconditioning. Um, and um, I'm not sure if you guys are, uh, David Foster Wallace was this great writer, American writer, and uh, he, he gave a commencement speech and it starts off talking about these two fishes and they're swimming along and, the, and they meet this big fish and the big fish goes, hey, boys, how's the water? And the two fishes look at each other and they go, what's water? And water is the culture, uh, is water is culture, something that we all swim in, something that none of us can can be unaffected by and I think our culture has been kind of one of the worst things for all of our mental health in kind of telling us you know kind of and, and reinforcing negative core beliefs so it is a complete life work re kind of it's almost kind of like re digging up your garden and sowing good seeds but our beliefs are seeds and whatever whatever seeds we sow grow and that goes into the uh, you know our confirmation grows them so i think it's every i think it's it, it's it's discipline to constantly question yourself, is this true? And that's one of the steps in this strategy I, I put out um, in, in this book I've written is, is cur curiosity, having curiosity about your core beliefs. You know, we may have a life of, 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 of you know, having this kind of vulnerability that we don't think we're enough, for example, that's definitely like one for me. And, you know, there is nothing, there is no magic spell, um, you know, abracadabra, um, Lingardian, Lingua, whatever that Hermione Granger one is, <laughs> um, that is going to, you know, remove them. But what it, but what we can do is lessen their impact on us. And I think that is the, the kind of call to action for all of us is let's become aware of the settings our brain is on, what it's alerting us to, what information it is prioritizing. Is it true? Is it right? Is it helpful? And things like writing grateful diary, things like writing a compassion exercise every single day, they seem really minimal and like, oh God, you know, I'm not going to do that. But actually what you're doing is you're reprogramming your brain. I think what's, what you could do as well, just like as you were saying there, I was like, this could work really well, is just write down a list of your beliefs, like what your beliefs are, and then write why you believe them. Because I think people don't really ask themselves that enough. Like, what is it that's made me believe this? So if it's like, if you're like, oh, I'm rubbish at my job, that was your belief. Then it's like, why do you believe that? 
and then write a list of that because that might actually unearth do you actually think that or is that just something you've told yourself again and again and again and also it has someone else told you because often our core beliefs you can actually ask well when did I first hear this and you can mm. attribute it to somebody in your life yeah yeah and because we're so impressionable I think what I always say to people as well is like if if they've got a negative thought I'm like well what would someone else say about you because it's like if you think you're bad at this then if you ask your friend do they what would you think if, if I asked them that question about you what would they say because that's genuinely the truth rather than what your self-talk is absolutely so that's why I built um happy not perfect the app because that every day I ask you questions like that you know what would you tell a friend experiencing what you are now which is basically third party perspective exercises yeah and so the app kind of does uh, formulates this for you in an easy way because that was really when I was kind of going through this kind of chronic chronic burnout I was exploring this for the first time like exercises that like you just said and I thought okay how do I make this easy for me and in a way I can do regularly because the problem is with all of these things rationally or kind of intellectually we can talk about it right now but actually are we doing it and that I'm mm -hmm. the worst at this you know I can go give talks about mental health to thousands of people and then walk off the stage and go oh my god imposter syndrome I was terrible oh god I'm a fraud and I'm, I'm like puppy do do the things that you say it doesn't it's all very well knowing these things but doing it is really where like you know the gold lies um but um it, what's interesting about a third party thing is actually it uses a different part of the brain when you actually use that third party so for example like how would my actually what would my friend um you know say about this or what would i advise a friend and you start activating the computer side of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, and that then calms down the emotional center, your amygdala. So it's always about these kind of like, you know, m calming the amygdala, activating that parasympathetic nervous system. So you're in your rest and digest system when you're kind of having your best thoughts and calming down that kind of stress response. And that's when often we're in the stress response, we kind of, we start spiraling and we start believing untrue thoughts. I feel like, We've given a superpower to anyone who's listening to this episode, regardless of what step of the ladder you're on in terms of your own path to self-discovery. It's as soon as you realize that you are in the water, as soon as you realize that this culture is around us. It's like for me now, I'm I'm so aware of that the, my behaviors are... Um, down to like conditioning and every like everything that's been everything that's happened during my life forms exactly who I am and so now when I do get advertised by Instagram and they know exactly where to hit and the marketers are really clever because they've crafted this ad because they know exactly how to trigger me to make a purchase I'm even if I do then go to what make the purchase I am aware of that I'm in the water. I'm aware that all of these these processes are being used on me. And as soon as we can see that, then we can start to take the power over it. And I think that really is the first step, is knowing that you're in the water. That's, that's when you can start to look at everything around you and see it in a different way, rather than because when, because the fish that don't know that they're in the water, it is just invisible to them. So it's as soon as we see it, then we can start to change it. Self-awareness, our greatest gift we can give ourselves. Boom. Um, in the intro to your podcast, you say that you are a recovering perfectionist. Yeah. Tell us about that. <laughs> Perfectionism is, I think, something that's actually not discussed enough. And I think perfectionism leads into really the core belief underneath perfectionism is like you're not enough. So you have to be perfect if you're going to even touch enough. And that was when I realized that that was quite a big revelation for me because I asked myself the question, why does everything need to be perfect? Like, why is it like, why do you become so stressed when it's not? And, um, you know, and if, and, 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 and I suddenly realized I was like, well, I don't, you know, I don't think that I'm, I'm worthy if it's not perfect or whatever and that ex like I mean that is so judgmental and so critical like you would never you don't expect that from other people but yet we put these unrealistic expectations on ourselves um and 
So that was a huge part of my healing in the last like kind of five years, I guess, is to, and again, it's like unlearning perfectionism. Oh, I mean, like that is a challenge in itself because you know, perfectionism is a coping strategy in a way. It's kind of, you know, oh, I'm feeling a bit uneasy. Well, okay, that's fine. I'm just going to put all that energy into making everything perfect around me. And actually that is a maladaptive coping strategy, as they would say. Um, and the, 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 like a healthy coping strategy is to kind of like really work on this, like this ability to let go of things and, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Right. And, um, and often, you know, perfectionism can, I think, stop creatives really like moving forward because we don't want to put things out or, um, you know, we kind of make, uh, you know, something I do, I'll create a huge body of work, but then put it out, but then actually not tell anyone about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know it's like and I and I know a lot of people who do, who do that it's like they write this amazing music and then they're like it's out but I'm not gonna tell anyone um um because you know that that yeah um so um it's a yeah it's a daily I daily I have to a daily work on um on on kind of like not being such a perfectionist because it is not good for anyone's mental health yeah, I mean, what I've heard you talk about before is is the importance of putting ideas into action, and perfectionism is one of those. And there are several that that stop us actually taking action um, on a goal. But at the end of the day, as I've heard you say many times, like the the action is the only thing that matters. Absolutely, and that's why I think that it goes back to like everything in mental health is about action and discipline. Like, and sometimes because we can't see mental health, we forget that. So we're like, "Oh, why is this not?" You know, and and sometimes it's really hard to action it. I mean, it feels like you are pushing against the biggest, biggest piece of rock, and you're like, "I just can't do it today." And that is when you've got to like use all your strength to force yourself through to do just do something tiny and that could be you just getting yourself out of bed and going for a five minute walk or that could be like really stopping yourself when you're in the moment of kind of a perfectionist angst and saying no I'm going to allow this and I, I'm okay, I'm okay. This is, you know, and, and separating for, for example, for me, like it's separating myself from my work because one of, I think the thing that really got caught up on me when I was building my first company, Happy Not Perfect, I associate myself so much with my work that if the app wasn't perfect, that meant I was a failure. And actually when, if anyone's built technology, you realize it fucks up the entire time. So if you're putting your identity inside something that like commonly has bugs, you know, and even the greatest apps have bugs, then, um, um, then, you know, that, that you're going to cause yourself a lot of unnecessary kind of like mental distress. But actually someone gave me a great metaphor that like, if, you know, if you take the best apps, I don't know, and I'm sure people would disagree with me that this is a great app, but it is a great app in terms of like, it's been very successful, but Uber, think how many times we have to update our app or think about all the apps that tells us update, update, update. I'm like, actually, why don't we take some inspiration from these apps that we're always updating to understand that we as human beings always are always in a process of updating and always, you know, and I think, I thought that was a lovely metaphor when I heard it because I thought, yeah, like we often kind of have this understanding that, or we have this belief that we should be these like kind of perfectly formed things. And actually like, we're always just, we're always just updating. I'm going to go and download my new software. Um, (laughs) This was, this is so cool. I think um, let's, let's do it again when, uh, when the book's out and uh, we'll, we'll read the book and we'll, we'll have a dive into, into the book. People can um, pre-order it, can't they currently? Yes, people can, pre- people can pre-order it and I'm going to be launching like a few kind of like competitions and things like that. So um, if anyone pre-orders it, send me their pre-order and you'll kind of have access to loads of different pre-events I'm going to do and I've got some exciting things in store. So yes, that would be amazing. Become part of the pre-order club. Where can they do that? So if you go to my Instagram, it's just in the link in my bio, which is probably the easiest thing. Or you can just search Amazon or Waterstones or Barnes and Noble or anywhere you buy your books. And it's just type in happy, not perfect. And um, what's your Instagram? It is Poppy Jamie, P-O-P-P-Y-J-A-M-I-E. Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so pleased. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so fun. 